the screen, and then we'll get started with that. All right, good morning. How's everybody doing today? All right, welcome again to Ridge Church. My name's Chris. Get to be one of the pastors around here and uh, just like to take this opportunity to officially welcome you to Seattle where the rain never stops. Um, man, we've had rivers flowing through uh, places in our yard that didn't used to have a river. So this is one of the rainiest Januarys I remember in a long time. But so for those of you that moved here, it's not like this all the time, I promise. But uh, hey, we're going to have a good time. October 1987, uh, the entire world watched as uh, a pretty unthinkable scenario began to unfold before our eyes. It happened in a little town in Texas called Midland, Texas. And there was a young mother who was watching her 18-month-old daughter, and she looked away for a second to take a phone call, and a mother's worst nightmare happened. Um, she was in the backyard of her aunt's house, and while she was taking this phone call, the little girl wandered off, as 18-month-olds do, and she ended up falling into a well, ended up getting lodged 22 feet below the surface, and there was no way to get to her. So the mom could see her, or couldn't see her, but could hear her, could hear her cries, her screams, and obviously, can you imagine the panic that set in? And what happened in the next 58 hours, it was like the world collectively kind of held our breath to see what was going to happen. Like everybody could relate. Like uh, this little girl would become known as baby Jessica to the world. And literally the entire world at that time was captivated by what was happening. 58 hours. So the entire rescue of this was covered on CNN. This, uh, it was all live on CNN. The, at that time, that was the only 24-hour network. Like, that's a thing now, but that wasn't a thing then. In fact, this was only the second time uh, that there had ever been 24-hour coverage of anything. The first time was when the Challenger uh, had exploded, the space shuttle exploded. There was 24-hour coverage. So we'd only seen this one other time. And so we're watching this unfold. But the country's watching this around the clock unfold in real time. And that's something that we we're not used to. See, that, that was before we had smartphones, right? Now everything is at the uh, at our fingertips in real time. We see it. This was before social media. So where you find everything, like literally it's in your feed before you can even get out of your car or get to your house or wherever it is you're going, you know about it. In fact, this was even before Al Gore invented the internet. That's an old people joke, just seeing if you were with me today. So this was like we were watching and experiencing something in a new way that we had never experienced. And every mom, every dad, every grandparent, every sibling, every child, everybody was invested because there was this like, there was this sense like, and a lot of people weren't saying it out loud, but there was this sense of like it could happen to me or someone I know. Like this thing wasn't like out of reach. Like sometimes when things happen, you're like, oh, that could never happen to me. This one, everybody realized it could happen to any one of us. And so the entire world, and some of you remember this happening, the entire world was on Team Jessica. Like people that didn't even pray were praying for Jessica. They're praying for her mom. Can you imagine what's going on with her mom and her dad? They're praying for everybody involved. They're praying for the rescue team. Like, and again, we're getting this around-the-clock coverage of this entire thing. So they ended up using this thing. It's called a rat hole rig. It's, it's a machine that's normally used to uh, plant telephone poles. And what they did was they took this machine, and they had to drill a hole parallel to the well. 
That's a delicate uh, situation because they didn't want to make, they didn't want the well to collapse. So they're drilling this hole parallel, and then eventually they would cut a hole horizontal, and they would go under, they would go literally underneath where she was stuck in the well and try to punch out below her so they could reach up and get her. But this rig was designed to go down, not over. So it was a very, very tedious process. And every time a rock would fall or there would be a bit of a shudder, the world would literally kind of collectively, again, hold our breath. As they were doing this, um, time started to tick because, again, this, this machine was designed to go down, not over. And so the, it felt like the minutes were, were, were pouring by. And every single minute that this little girl stayed in the well, her life was in greater danger. And so they, they lowered oxygen down into, pumped oxygen down into this, uh, this well. They started to sing. And there, there's actually recordings of this. Uh, some of the, the rescue workers and the paramedics started to sing nursery rhymes to her. And they would, in between hearing her cry and well in pain and in fear, every once in a while they would hear this little girl's voice singing with them these nursery rhymes. And they would pay, play these clips, and we would, again, the world is watching this whole thing unfold. Finally, on the evening of October 16th, 1987, after 58 grueling hours, baby Jessica was lifted to safety. And the world, like, and I remember, I I watched this as it happened, the world simultaneously kind of breathed this sigh of relief and then also erupted into like this celebration, like homes and and classrooms, like everybody felt like, it didn't feel like just Jessica and her family won, it felt like we won, it felt like the whole world won, because this was the only thing anybody was talking about, was what was going on with baby Jessica's. The photos captured the paramedics bringing her out, Uh, she was cradled in one of their arms and her head was wrapped in this white gauze, her arms were caked with dirt, her eyes were barely open, and... um, And this is how the story ended, though. Like, she was safe. She she was rescued. Like, the the story actually has a happy ending. Fast forward to 2006. Baby Jessica is now 19 years old, and she meets the love of her life. She gets married. She has two kids, Simon and Cheyenne, that are actually two years apart. And she's doing just fine. This is the end of the story. This is is the happily ever after. She was rescued. That's how the story ends. But we didn't know that. Like, her family didn't know that. Like, everybody that's watching, her family, everybody that's experiencing this story, we didn't know that. If we had known this, if we had known this was how the story ended, it would have massively shaped and influenced the way we experienced those 58 hours. Like, if we had been able to kind of fast forward or transport or teleport to the future and know, hey, it's it's all going to be fine. Everything that we were feeling, I'm not saying we wouldn't have felt it, but we would have experienced that entire, everybody, her family, her friends, the onlookers, all of us that had become invested in this this story, we would have experienced this entire 58 hours radically differently if we had known that this is how the story ends. And the same thing is true with your life. Same thing is true with my life. If we knew how the story ended, like if we knew, like if we had a snapshot of where it was going and what was going to happen, it affects how we live in the moment. That's the reality. Now, there's a really big difference between the word rescue and the word rescued. These these are very different. They sound similar. You can put the two up there, rescue and rescue. So the rescue is like I, like I need it. Like I'm in it right now, whatever it is. Like I'm in this, this challenge relationally. I'm in this challenge with my health. I'm in this challenge financially. Like, like I right now presently need someone, something outside of myself to help me. Like I'm, I'm in the well. Like I need someone to lower oxygen or to put oxygen into the well. I need someone to drop a rope down. I need someone to actually help me. That's rescue. Rescued is past tense. Like it's done. Like it's already happened. Like it past tense, I've already been, I used to be in the well, but I'm no longer in the well. And I'm just telling you, which one of these we embrace and we choose to embrace as we live our lives makes all the difference in how we experience our lives. If you live your life in a constant sense of I am in need of rescue, and sometimes that's true, and it's true of us in this room in some ways, versus I am rescued, It completely changes the way we experience 
our lives. And that's the essence of this series when we're talking about this idea of rescue. And so here's what I want to do for the next few minutes. I want to look at what the Apostle Paul has to say about this. Now, he talks directly to this idea. Uh, Maybe you didn't know that Paul talked about these kind of practical things or even the Scripture, but it's incredibly practical, especially as he teaches to the churches. So if you don't know Paul's story, uh, Paul started off as a person that hated Christianity, tried to stop it. He had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus, and after his encounter with the resurrected Jesus, he became one of the greatest advocates and builders of of the church, what we know as the church today. And so Paul would write letters. He would help start churches. He would write letters to encourage churches, and he wrote to one group of people in a place called Colossae, and there was a group of people that he had actually never met, and he was writing from prison, and the reason that he was in prison was because he wouldn't stop talking about Jesus. Like, the guy that hated Jesus now wouldn't stop talking about Jesus. He kept saying, he's the Messiah, which bothered people that didn't think Jesus was the Messiah. He said, he is the chosen one. He is, and then he would say, and he's resurrected. I saw him. He would say these things, and people didn't like it. The religious leaders didn't like it. Consequently, he was in jail for this. And Paul had a friend named Epaphras that had actually started a church in the region of Colossae. And their uh, scriptures tell us that Epaphras had come to visit Paul in prison, And while he was in prison, he gave a report on this church that he had started. He said, hey, as you can imagine, like if you've been at church, in a church at any any length of time, he said, hey, some stuff's going good, some stuff's not. Some people are kind of getting it and others aren't. And he said, and I've got some Christians, there's some of them that are starting to like question their faith. There are some that are having challenges and they're starting to have doubts. And let me just stop here and say this. I was actually talking to some of my kids about this this week. This is, this is a really important thing. I think as, as a church and as Christians, we don't do a good job talking about this sometimes. Your faith can coexist with doubts. Like, just because you have challenges in your journey, like if you're a new Christian or you're kind of, maybe even if you've been a Christian for a while, you need to be reminded of this. Or if you're on the outside looking and considering Christianity, you can be a Christian, you can be a follower of Jesus and still experience challenges. You can still have doubts. So when you have challenges and when you have doubts, don't lean out. Let that, to be, let that be your indicator. Let that be your reminder to actually lean in. That's what was happening with this group of people in Colossae. And so Paul decides to write, decides to address it. He wants to encourage them. Anything that's off in their mindset, he wants to correct the mindset. So in the very first chapter of Colossians, Paul basically doubles down on the thing that got him put into prison. This whole idea, he's talking about Jesus as a Messiah, he's a chosen one, he's the exalted one, he's a savior, he's indeed resurrected. He says all that same stuff, but he actually captures it in the first part, in the very first chapter of Colossians, he captures it in a poem. And in the midst of this poem, we find the two verses that are our theme verses for this entire series. Jim read them last week. I would encourage you to go back and listen to Jim's message from last week. It was so good. But I'm going to dive into these verses in a little bit of detail today. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, again, our theme verses for this series. This is what Paul said to a group of people that were some of them new in their faith, others perhaps a little bit older. No one was old in their faith because the church itself was new. The resurrection of Jesus was a new reality for people. But this is what he said to them. He says, for he, talking about Jesus, has rescued, there's our word, he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Now, I don't know what comes to your mind when you think dominion of darkness, but it's not like the satanic underworld and like the worst Halloween expression you've ever thought of. Like maybe in some way, shape, or form, that's it. But that's not really what Paul's talking about. Paul's using darkness as just a metaphor for light. Like Jesus used light as a metaphor for who he was. He said, hey, I am the light of the world. In other words, when we, are encounter, when we encounter Jesus, it brings light to our life. He was using darkness as a metaphor to say, hey, listen, you were living with a sense where there was no direction. There, there was no purpose. There was no meaning. And all of us have experienced this at some point, maybe in a micro way, maybe in a macro way, maybe in like some portion of your life you felt like you didn't have direction. Maybe you felt in your whole life You don't have direction. He said, you guys, you were in a place where you were living, where you were kind of like just, you know, go to work, eat, sleep, drink, rinse, repeat. Like that's what we do. Like over and over, you were living with a sense where it was darkness. You you weren't necessarily making strategic decisions. You weren't necessarily living in the best way. There wasn't necessarily any kind of moral code. There was no direction. You were living in darkness. He says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And then he gives a contrast. He says, and he's brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. So Paul's contrast, he said the old way was darkness, 
He said, but there's a new thing. He said, this is what happened. Like Paul's describing to these people what actually happened to them. He said, you lived in this old way. It was defined by darkness. Now you've been invited into this new thing, the kingdom of the Son. This, and he's talking about Jesus when he says this. You've been brought into the kingdom of the Son that he loves. Now Jesus all the time talked about kingdom. He talked about a new kingdom that would be defined by a different ethic than every other kingdom of the world, every other empire, every other government that ever has existed, ever will exist. Jesus said, my kingdom will work differently. We'll treat people differently. Because of the Imago Dei, the image of God on people, every human will have value. In my kingdom, the driving and determining ethic of how we interact will be love. We will love first. That will be how my kingdom works. And so Jesus always talked about this kingdom. And what Paul is reminding them, and this is so powerful. He said, hey, you used to be something else. You used to be something else, but now you're actually kingdom. You're a part of this kingdom. You're citizens of this kingdom of Jesus. And let me just say, if that one concept ever sunk in for us, it changes everything. Like our citizenship, if you're a follower of Jesus, is not here. Like, this is, this is the foreign place for us. And we're supposed to bring pieces of that kingdom to this place. That's what Paul's he was reminding them. Hey, you've been brought out of this thing. The old thing was darkness. The new thing is you're a citizen of this kingdom. He says, for he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son that he loves. This old and new contrast. He's given us a new identity. That's the essence. We read all throughout the scripture that when we put our faith in Jesus, we're given a new identity. He says, you're not only a son and a daughter of God, but you're citizens of this kingdom. And then he continues, he says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is what Paul's saying. He's reminding these people they're, they're having, again, Epaphras, his friend, said, hey, they're having some challenges. <laughs> like, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know there's challenges, right? He says, we're having challenges. There's some doubts. And so Paul's reminding them, this is what you used to be. This is what you are. Now, this word rescue is a really interesting word. There's so much packed in it. It's actually also translated multiple times throughout the scripture as the word deliver. Now, this is really good news. Paul, Paul's saying that Jesus actually can. Actually, he's saying Jesus did. He's not saying Jesus can. He's saying Jesus has delivered you. He's saying, he's saying God has already put this in motion, or Jesus has already put this in motion. He has already delivered you from whatever it is you need to be delivered from, but specifically into a new identity. He's saying he's already delivered you, to which if, if I'm listening to Paul, and maybe this is kind of your story, if even as a pastor says this to you this morning, you say, well, I don't feel delivered. <laughs> like, have you ever been in a state where someone's saying something that's true of you, but you don't feel it's true? You're like, I don't feel very delivered. <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I kind of, I, some of you, well, I lost my job last, last week or last month. Like, I just, I'm, I'm headed towards a new career or I'm living with a diagnosis that I didn't expect and, and, and it's not going away and the doctors haven't helped yet. Or I'm in a relational thing that I've tried to solve it and I just can't solve it. I don't feel very delivered. Have you ever, you ever felt like somebody gives you something or they tell you something kind of fluffy in church and you're like, but I kind of don't feel like that's true. Here, here's something I want you to consider. Let me go back to the well for just a second. You got baby Jessica that's in the well. Technically, Jessica was already rescued even when she was in the well. Like the story was always going to end this way. Like, it was always going to end this way, even in the moment that she was in the well. She just didn't know it yet. I mean, none of us knew it. The world's watching. We're on the edge of our seats. Like we watched more CNN that week than we ever had in our lives and ever have since, right? We didn't know it. We didn't know how the story was going to end, but the story was always going to end this way. It was only with the clarity, and only now with the clarity of looking back, that we know how the story ends. And this is what Paul is saying. This is such a, a powerful concept that Paul is speaking into the life of these individuals, these Christians. He says, Paul's saying, hey, you got to remember this. If you're Jesus followers, and remember, he's talking to followers of Jesus. He's saying, this is true for us as well. Because of the work of the cross, what Jesus did on the cross, and because of the empty tomb, the fact that he's not still in the tomb, but he's resurrected, because of those two things, we are, we're currently rescued. In other words, even if you're in the well today, like if you feel like you would describe yourself stuck, that's what a well is. If you're stuck spiritually, if you're stuck emotionally, physically, financially, some kind of, some kind of situation in your life, if you're stuck, whatever it is, 
ultimately, and this is really good news, and this is what Paul was telling them, because this is a group of people that were stuck. Ultimately, rescue is how the story ends. Rescue is how your story ends. Now, I say that, and let me just give you a spoiler alert. Some of you have been Christians for a little while. If you're a new Christian, or if you're considering Christianity, here's the spoiler alert from those of us that have been around for just a few, uh, few years in terms of following Jesus. It's not always rainbows and butterflies. Like just because you decide to put your faith in Jesus and his work on the cross has accomplished something for you, it doesn't mean that life is easy. Sometimes, and I don't think we talk about this enough, sometimes we live with scars from our time in the well. Sometimes we walk with a limp from our time in the well. Baby Jessica underwent 15 surgeries in the next couple of years. Her foot, as she was stuck in this well, was hanging over her. And if you can imagine, I can't, I can't get my foot over my head. If I do, I go to the hospital immediately. Uh, I'm not very flexible. But her foot was over her head for 58 hours. She had gangrene, lost a toe, and ended up having a bunch of surgeries to reconstruct her entire foot. She had a scar that went from her, from her forehead all the way down to the bridge of her nose. Paul, Paul is not saying, and I'm not saying, and no church leader should say that there won't be scars, that there won't be hardship. But here's what Paul is doing, and this is so powerful. He's giving a snapshot of the end. I want to show this picture again. He's giving a snapshot of the end, a picture of uh, baby Jessica and the, the collage I think we've got. He's giving a snapshot of this. And he just, he's just saying, hey, guys, if we knew how the story ended, how would that affect how you experience what's happening right now? If you knew that the ultimate thing is that you're going to be rescued. If you knew that even though you're gonna, there may be some bumps and bruises, there may be some scars, you may walk with a limp, but you know that ultimately the story ends with rescue. How does that change the way the story unfolds? Paul says that even if you can't feel it, and I think this is so important, he says even if you can't see it, even if you can't imagine it, if you're currently in a well, like at some portion of your life or perhaps your whole life you feel like you're stuck, he says what defines us is the word rescued, past tense, with one condition, if you're a follower of Jesus. He's reminding these new and these old Christians, and again, none of the Christians are very old because Christianity itself was new, but he's reminding these new and these old Christians to live with a picture of the end. He's saying this. He's saying, I want you to live as though you've already been rescued. He's got a group of Christians that are struggling. He's saying, hey, let, let me just remind you. You've got to live out of what is. You may not be able to see it. You don't know how the story ends, but let me just tell you, you've been rescued. Live as though you have been rescued. Any of you uh, that can remember this, some of you, this is closer to home than others because you're in this scene right now. You remember when you're dating, you remember first dates? For some of you, maybe it was like just first date. Like you met the love of your life, you went on a date with that one person, and that was it. Some of you dated a lot, more than you want to talk about, right? But you remember first dates, how terrible they are? Like how awkward they are? Like what if you knew on the, like before it happened how it was going to end? That would be better, wouldn't it? <laughs> Like, especially like if you're sitting across the table at dinner, whatever the, the, the date is, of course, it's an amazing date because it's your first date. You didn't go to Taco Bell. It was something amazing, right? But if you knew sitting across the table from him or her, like there was a sense in you like, I, I think I, I really like this person. I really want it to work out. Like, but you don't know. Like, you don't know, like, you've got food on your shirt, like, you said some dumb things, you don't know if it's going to work out. But if you knew that it was going to work out, if you had a picture at the end, wouldn't that change how you sat there on the other side of the table? Like, you, I mean, you're all nervous. You're like, in fact, that point, you got ketchup on your shirt, you're like, yeah, it's going to work out, though. It's fine, right? Like, no matter what, you know, or if it's, if it's the other way, like, you've been on one of those dates, and you're like, I hope I never see this person again in the rest of my life. Like, what if you knew you're never going to bump into him again? Like, like, you're sitting there with anxiety trying to think, like, how am I going to fake the phone call to get out of this thing? Have I got my friend? Did I, oh, I forgot to tell my friend to call me to get me. Like, and you're, but if you knew, if you knew the end of the story was that I will never bump into this person or see them again the rest of my life. Sure, it's a small city, but good luck with that, right? Like, I'm never going to see them again. I'm not going to bump into them in Walmart or in a restaurant. Then you would sit in that moment 
with a different level of confidence. This is what Paul's painting the picture of. He says, when you live with a picture of the end, it affects how you live in the moment. It doesn't change the hardship necessarily. It doesn't take away the scars. But you live with a different sense of confidence when you know how the story ends. I want to talk about that word rescued. It's really interesting. And again, I mentioned this earlier. It packs a punch. Uh, the little Greek word rescued is the same word that's used in Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 13. And it's translated deliver. This is what it says. And some of you will recognize this. Matthew says this. It says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, a little quick Bible trivia, a little test, you guys. Who knows who said this and what the context of this was? Anybody? can't hear any of you shout it out. It's, it's always nerve-wracking to shout it out in church. You're like, I think he's trying to trick us, right? All right, this is the Lord's Prayer. You guys heard of that? All right, and Jesus said it, all right? Pretty much anytime somebody asks a question in church, you can go with Jesus, God, or the Bible, and you're going to get close, all right? <laughs> Jesus is the one that said this, and he's talking to his disciples. He says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, how many of you in the room uh, would say that you're pretty good at cooking? Like, I'm not, maybe not an expert, but you're pretty good at cooking. Let me see your hands. It's all right. I ask you, so it's not boasting if I ask you. All right. How many of you are sitting next to someone that has their hand up and they're not really good at cooking? <laughs> all right. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not. I'm not. Um, I've, I cook a, gr a, a mean grilled cheese, and it, that's where it ends. Um, so, but I, I, I'll, I'll try. Like, so if you were to come into the kitchen, you were to see me cooking, you would just be like, Chris, I don't think that's your thing. Like, I, I, I mean, you're probably good at something else. That's not that. Now, my wife, on the other hand, is an amazing cook. She can cook anything. I have proof of this, right? She, she is an amazing cook. So if you were to see me cooking and you were to see my wife cooking, here's what you would say. You'd say, hey, Chris, maybe you should watch her. Like, do whatever she's doing, you should just do that. Or better yet, you should just let her do it and you go in the other room, right? So this is what is happening in this verse. You're like, I don't think that's what was happening. It is. Stay with me. Jesus was doing something that they had never seen. Jesus was praying, and they looked and said, we don't think we know how to cook. His disciples watched him pray, and they said, man, we're not doing something right. And they said, will you teach us to pray? And so as Jesus teaches them to pray, this is what he says. He says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver. That's the same word for rescue. Deliver us from evil. Now, Paul, in the verse that we read earlier, in his context, he talks about this deliver or this rescue in past tense. Now, here Jesus is, and he's talking to his followers, and he's saying, I want you to pray when you're in it. Like, in other words, he's saying, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is what I want you to pray. In other words, Jesus is saying, when you're in it, in what? Whatever it is. Whatever it is that's challenging you, whatever it is that has you stuck, whatever arena of life or your whole life that you're stuck, he said, I want you to pray when you're in it that you, deliver, that you get delivered from it, that I rescue you from this thing. So here Paul is saying it's past tense. You're already rescued. Now here Jesus is saying, I will rescue you. So which is it? Are we rescued or are we being, is it, is it active like we're being rescued right now, like he's rescuing us or is it, is it already happened? Which one? And the answer is both. Both are true on a macro level. And this is so important. Because of the cross, because of the empty tomb, you and I are rescued. But then this is what, this is what he's saying. But then as you live life, Jesus says, I'm rescuing you. When you need a little bit of oxygen, when you're in the well, when you need a nursery rhyme, when you need someone to lower a rope, I have rescued you on the, in the big picture, and I will rescue you in the moment. This is great news. You have both been rescued, and Jesus is rescuing us. But this, this little Greek word, the English doesn't fully capture what it means. There's this, like, anytime you translate something from one language into another, some words translate perfectly, others don't. Originally, this was Greek, and as it translates, the word deliver, the word rescue, they don't fully capture the meaning of this little Greek word. This little Greek word literally means to draw out or to rescue or to deliver for one's self. This is a big deal. This means that when Jesus taught these guys to pray, he says, I want you to pray that I will deliver you. I want you to pray that I will rescue you from evil, whatever thing is coming against you. And what Jesus meant when he said this, he's saying that I'm not just rescuing you from something. I'm rescuing you for someone. And that is a massive change. 
If we miss this, we miss something that is foundational to Christianity. If we miss this distinction that we're not just rescued from, yes, God is and he does do that. Jesus is and he does do that. He's rescuing us from, but he has also rescued us for something. There is a purpose for which we were rescued. And if we miss this distinction, what ends up happening is we end up seeing Jesus as a genie in the bottle. That we just need him. Like, all right, Jesus, I need you. I need rescue. Right, here I am again. I know I said I'd never do it, but here I am stuck again. It's me again. Jesus, I need you. Genie in a bottle. Jesus, I need you. And here's what happens when we end up, uh, without even knowing it, a, a culture has done this. When we end up addressing Jesus in that way, our relationship to him becomes conditional. Because if he doesn't show up as we thought he should, or he would, or we thought how it needed to happen, or in the time frame that we wanted it, then that becomes the condition upon our relationship. In other words, if God doesn't behave as we wanted him to behave, if he doesn't perform within the timelines we wanted him to, it becomes conditional. In fact, I would say that one of the reasons, not, not all, but one of the many reasons that there are so many people in our culture that are deconstructing from faith is because they've misunderstood what the nature of the relationship to Jesus is to be about, that Jesus doesn't exist for our good. He doesn't exist just so that we can be rescued. Yes, that is true, but he rescues us from something. And then the second part is this. He rescues us for something. We are rescued from danger, but make no mistake, we are rescued for God. And I'm telling you, if we miss that second part, we miss the essence of Christianity. And I think that we're embedded in a culture right now that's presenting a, a version of Jesus as a genie in a bottle. And yes, he is. He, wants to, he has rescued you, and he wants to rescue you. But it's always for a purpose, and the purpose isn't just so we can live for ourselves and build our own private empires, so we can build kingdom. Paul, as, you, as, as we put all this together, Going back to Colossians chapter 1, he says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and he's brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. And then Paul ends it, puts it all together this way. He says, In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He reminds him, Because you've been rescued, past tense, because of the work of the cross, this is such a big deal to you. You're not living for forgiveness. You're living from forgiveness forgiveness like we're not we're not trying to earn something like you're not trying to perform you're not trying to make the good scales outweigh the bad scales I'm not just you know I'm just going to be better my new year's resolution I'm just going to be better I'm going to do it I'm going to go to church more I'm going to give more I'm going to serve more you're not just trying to be good it's not about performance and he's reminded us in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins because this rescue is already accomplished we're not working for forgiveness we're working from forgiveness what would it look like to live as if we were people that were already forgiven not with a sense of guilt not with a sense of shame, but with a sense of freedom that we are already forgiven. It's not about performance. Let me tell you the reason that we're doing this series called Rescue. Uh, one of the, the taglines is finding the new me in a lonely world. Uh, we know that statistics tell us this is the loneliest generation in human history, the most digitally connected generation in human history, but the loneliest. We also know this. You'll see it in the title package. You'll hear us talk about it. We've been using this number 113 a lot with this series. So one, of, one of the reasons is because of this passage of Scripture, Colossians 113. But the other is this. I read an article uh, last year. I think it was Charlotte Observer. This said that 113 people a day move into to Charlotte. Some of you are like, I know. I've been in the traffic, right? Like 113 people a day move into our city. And here's the reality. Most of them, if not all of them, I would argue all, are lonely. Maybe not like in an epic loneliness for all of them. Some of them it is. Some of them it's dire. But in some way, at some level, every single human being that's moving into our city, including all of us sitting here this morning, need rescue. But when I say that, that creates a tension, doesn't it? Like you're like, ah, I know people who need rescue. I don't, I don't need rescue, right? Like, isn't it true? Like, in fact, as we were, I've got a really talented team that we work with as we're putting together a series, and we were doing a creative meeting around this series, and this idea came up, and one of the ones in our, our creative meeting said, hey, listen, 
Chris, I hear what you're saying, but if I'm one of the 113, and I hear you talking about this message, and you say, uh, you know, you need rescue, he said, that would be offensive. Like, I would feel like I don't need, like, it feels like just one more time that the church and Christians and God are way up there, and they figured it all out, and I'm way down here, and church is going to reach in and rescue. He said, what if, what if some of those people don't feel like they need to be rescued? That would be offensive. And we actually had a really good conversation around this. And, and I, I said, man, I, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair thing. And here's my response. Is it possible that the idea that we need to be rescued is both offensive and true? Like, at some level, no matter what our pride says, no matter what our independence says, no matter what our success or our portfolio says, we all need rescue. I, I think it might be that it's true and it's also a little bit offensive. But then I said this. This is, this is the thing that changes it. Listen to how Jesus did it. Like, Jesus could have performed this rescue in so many different ways. He could have sent lightning bolts. He could have destroyed us, started over. He could have done whatever he wanted to do, right? He, he, could, have, he could have shouted from heaven. He could have condemned us. But this is what he does. This is how Jesus performed this rescue. He didn't condescend. He didn't judge. Philippians 2 tells us this, that he didn't consider equality with God as something to be grasped. But instead, that he took on the form of a servant, in other words, this is, this is how God, this is how Jesus performed rescue. He became one of us, and he walked with us. And that's how he rescued us. He put his hand on Matthew's shoulder. He said, man, I know where you've been. I know what you've done. He touched lepers. No one in that society would touch lepers. He healed blind people. He, he had meals with people like Zacchaeus, who were terrible human beings that had cheated others. He was known as the friend of tax collectors and sinners. He walked in human flesh. The God of the universe became one of us in order to rescue us. Who wouldn't want to know that God? That's different than any the construct of any other religion in the world that God would become one of us, walk amongst us, know our names, to touch us, to have conversations, to have meals on the beach so that he can rescue us. And in the end, as Jesus took his final breath on the cross, he uttered these three words that in English have been translated, it is finished. And when Jesus said that, what he meant was our rescue for the present or future was already complete. <laughs> In other words, he, he's saying everything we need, everything you need, everything I need, everything you have ever needed and will ever need was accomplished in the cross. Everything, it, in that moment, it was finished. And this is fascinating to me. Before we were ever technically in the well, whatever well, Jesus had already provided the rescue. He already lowered the rope. And when this sinks in, it changes everything. So again, I want to ask you, how differently would the world have experienced baby Jessica's story if we had started with this image of her being rescued or the, the, the end game? Like, how differently would it end if we knew, like, this, like, how, how would we have experienced that story if we knew this, this is where it's going? How differently would you experience your story if you truly grasp that you were already rescued? If your story began, if you knew that your story began with this image, the cross, where he said, I know, I know it hurts. I know you're walking with a limp. I know you have a scar. I know you have questions. But everything you need, I've already done it. It's finished. This is where our story begins. There was this uh, news article where as Jessica was an adult, I uh, came across this quote. She said, seeing the well for the first time as an adult was hard. But it wasn't upsetting. To me, it was a symbol that it could have taken my life, but it didn't. I had God on my side. 
that day. The cross is a symbol that God was on your side that day. Like, he walked among us. He knew names. He knows your name. The cross is a symbol that he's on your side and that he has rescued you and he is rescuing you. And that's a powerful reality. What would it look like to live from that? I want to give you just a couple of takeaways. I know we covered a lot of ground. So a couple of takeaways or kind of wrap up thoughts, recap. It's like the cliff notes at the end. You're like, man, I would have just come for the end of it if I know you're going to do that, right? First one is this. We're not working from forgiveness. We're working, uh, we're not working for forgiveness. We're working from forgiveness. Again, Jesus said it's finished. Like, you know, this isn't, this isn't a performance-based religion. Like, I've already done it. You couldn't have done the work anyway. I did it for you. Second thing, we're, we're rescued from danger, but we're rescued for God, listen, if we're not careful, we'll end up living a version of Christianity that's a me-centric version where Jesus and God are a spoke on the wheel rather than the centerpiece, rather than the hub. Uh, And let me just say this. Some of you, you don't feel like you need rescue today, like you're doing great financially in your career, your health is good, your marriage is good, your relationship is good. That just means you've been rescued in this moment. You're rescued. And here's what I would remind you. We're not rescued just from danger. We're rescued for God. So if you are in a good season, then don't just build your own private empire. Build the kingdom. That's what it's for. You're rescued for a purpose. And when you find your rhythm in that purpose, you'll find a greater amount of satisfaction than in anything else that you could ever do with your life. This is what it means. Moving from darkness to light. We have purpose. We have meaning. We have reason for our work. The third thing, the rescue rope has already been lowered in the next move is yours. Let me just say, some of you here this morning, you're not a Christian yet. You're not sure if you're a Christian. The cross lowered the rope. The next move is yours. You put your faith in Jesus and say, that's it, I'm in. I'm receiving that rescue. And the fourth kind of takeaway is avoid old wells. Just thought I'd give you something really practical to end on. I'll give you two questions, and then Kelsey's going to come and, and lead us in a song. What would it look like for you and I to live as one and as ones that have been rescued from something and for someone. Like, I don't know, just as you think about this year, what would it look like to live that way? You've been rescued from something, but you've been rescued for something. Even if you say, I don't know what it is, I don't know the, the, the details of it, man, wouldn't that be a great thing to wrestle through? God, what is it that you have for me? And then what would it look like for you to take the rescue rope right now? Last week we did this thing with this, this rescued sign that you see, and you heard, maybe heard CK say this earlier. We had uh, 11 people that said, hey, we want to go public with the fact that we've been rescued. Past tense, it's done. We want, and, and what we did to symbolize it was we put these locks on the chain. And here's what we're praying. We're praying this year that we'll see 113 locks go on that chain. And for some of you today, you know it needs to be you. You put your faith in Jesus, you take the rope that's already been lowered and lean in to what happens next. I asked Kelsey to sing this specific song, and I just want her to sing it over you. You can, if you know the words, you can sing it with her, but I just want you to stay seated. This is a song by Lauren Daigle, and it actually is written from the perspective. Uh, it's like God is singing it or saying it to us. At one point it says, I'll send out an army. And I don't know, I don't know how you come into this new year. I don't know how you come into this moment. I don't know how you come into just thinking about God. But he's crazy about you. He has and he will rescue you. And so as as she sings this song, just receive it as a prayer. Receive it as a a thing that God is saying over you, that God is saying to you. That is how he thinks of you. It's how he thinks of all the people that work around you, the people that you're in relationship to, your family. This This is how he thinks of us. And let me just say this. If you're here and you just say, I've never put my faith in Jesus and I want to take the rope, some point during this song, I want you to say a simple prayer. Just say, Jesus, I'm putting my faith in you. I'm taking the rope that you have provided through the cross and I want to become a son or a daughter of the living God. Just whisper some version of your words and your prayer to God. He'll hear it and it'll be the beginning of your journey. So Kelsey's going to lead us. You guys lean in, let these moments be what they need to be in celebration or in reflection.